Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. So basic, simple, simple agenda. There we go. A little bit about myself. I've got a background in computer science. I spent the first 12, 13 years of my career on, uh, and I'm going to age myself here, IBM System 36s, 38s, AS 400s. And when I did start university, we did program and punch cards. So I've kind of been around just a, a couple of years. Went off, got an MBA in finance and accounting. Got into the FinOps world at Allstate, where I helped Greenfield, their FinOps uh, program for a division called Arity. Those are the folks who monitor your driving behavior. Went over to AWS in the cloud economics group, and specifically private equity, which is going to inform a lot of my conversation and my jaded opinion in the world uh, here today. And now, as of six weeks, I've joined Bruno, who was part of the keynote, over at Newbank. And an overarching theme I have when I approach FinOps is, first and foremost, empathy for the engineers. I think that's important, especially if you've come from a lift and shift world, that you now have this new muscle you didn't realize you had to exercise, grow, and, and refine, and that is the vector of cost. You know, before, it's simply about meeting my objectives, meeting my SLAs, making sure my security is within you know, compliance, all the regulatory stuff you have to do. But when you come from on-prem, it's a whole set of muscles, and you have to be sensitive to that fact. The other thing I always like to tell people, and I refer to them, there's the hands-on keyboards, that's the engineers, architects, developers, um, operations folks, and the folks who do not have hands-on keyboards. Right-sizing production resources is an engineering act of courage. Everybody knows when you get it wrong. And that's why engineers are very reticent. They test the living heck out of everything. I see a lot of nodding in the audience, so hopefully a lot of engineers out there. It's simple, it's not easy. And I think that gets lost on a lot of people who don't have their hands on keyboards. Early on, especially when I was at AWS, you're viewed as an authority. Do not demonstrate your competence in FinOps at the expense of others. It's an awesome way to not make friends. That's an awesome way to burn down any chance of cooperation you're going to get with somebody. When you come in and you say, I would have done this, you should have done that, we could have done it this way, you're not building collaboration. It's an immediate, you're just dead in the water. You're not going to win over hearts and minds and affect changes in behaviors and how people approach the cloud. Subtly, another form of that is when you present opportunities to people who don't have their hands on keyboard. It's really important that when you talk about cost efficiency and operational efficiency, you have to choose your words carefully because the insinuation, the underlying undertone is that you're saying somebody's incompetent or not fully competent. And especially if you're in your crawl of your crawl, walk, run phase, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, and you have to express it as opportunity. We use the past as a benchmark to make our plans today, to make tomorrow better, move forward a day, repeat. Because if you start to insinuate people are not competent, bad things happen. And having been in the private equity space, anybody who's owned by private equity or you've ever been in the VC world, when they smell blood, they strike. And the PE partners or the VC partners are telling the C-suite, you're not doing a good job. You can get people fired by using the wrong words in the context I had to operate with in, in private equity. So it's really, really important. Choose your words carefully. Context matters. And for people who don't have hands on keyboards, they don't have the context. So before you present this opportunity or you know, nicer words than this miss savings or in, in the prior one, I used to call them oops bills. Be very, very careful how you choose your words. It really matters and you can truly impact people's careers. And lastly, you know, what does it say? When I point a finger at you, there's three pointing back at me. The things you promise, especially in the private equity and VC space, you're talking to professional numbers people. Guess what one thing they remember? Numbers. So when you offer up savings estimates, when you talk about here's what the bridge is going to be during my double bubble during the migration process, dial it in, give yourself some comfort. 
those numbers will absolutely come back to haunt you at some point in time if you get it wrong. You know, the top part of it, it's headcount, deadlines, and budgets. We're all used to it. We all have to balance. And I was talking to Bruce uh, Warner over at GCP prior, and he made a very good observation when in the keynote they were talking about what is people next year going to look like. And Bruce said, the recession. Nailed it. Who's rebudgeting for second half? Who's reconfiguring uh, headcount and whatnot? Your constraints are changing. Constraints at Newbank are changing. We're in fintech. There was a 75 basis point jump in the, in, by the Fed this week, and fintech's out of favor. And we have to adapt, you know, improvise, adapt, and overcome, to use that, that marine phrase. The next thing that was really important to me that I really discovered is, you know, we all talk about crawl, walk, run. But crawl, walk, run has more nuance. You got the C-suite. Are they crawling, walking, or running? You've got the product owners. Where are they at? You have the, uh, the teams, and then you have the individuals. Everybody is someplace different in their crawl, walk, run journey. And it's important to have the right kind of context. For the folks on the crawl side, I like to be a, a, uh, an educator. Here's what you can do. Here's good practices. These are the things you need to think about. Let's start working on it. In the walk phase, I think of it it's almost like being a parent. For those of us who are, are parents in the room, you want your kids to do the best, but sometimes you got to let them make mistakes. And not mistakes like running Macy over a 50 terabyte database at, database at uh, five bucks a gig. That, you, you stop your kids from getting hurt badly, but sometimes you learn from your mistakes and you have to go down that path in that way. And hey, I tried to convince you. I gave you my best thinking. You didn't want to take it. You're, you're going to get a bump or a scrape. You don't let somebody break a bone, metaphorically speaking, but sometimes you got to let them make the mistake and it happens. And then ideally, when you get to run, you're a facilitator. And that's you know, very much where you want to be. Your industry matters. Coming from FinTech, we're highly regulated. Anybody here, who would have a change in priorities if GDPR, the nice folks in the EU, made a change in the regulation? Who'd have to stop, drop, and reconfigure? Most of us would. And so fin, you know, FinOps isn't top of mind for everyone. So you have to weave it into the conversation and show how it makes everything better. Uh, for everyone. Your industry maturity matters. When I was at Allstate, insurance is, if I, take, if I grow a thousand customers in the United States, I have to take them from somewhere else. So cost matters, and cost, that maturity factor in that specific industry makes cost very important. Gives you a big seat at the table, but you have to use it wisely and you have to deliver the goods. And also your industry competitiveness. If you're in a feature war with your competitors, Sometimes FinOps takes a back seat to staying current and making sure you're holding or main, holding your market share or making attempts to grow your market share. You know, and then the company in their journey, if you're in a growth phase, and I'm gonna use Newbank and um, Bruno mentioned it, you know, we went public in December. Wall Street loves growth. There's only one more thing Wall Street loves more than growth. Why would they not? It's profitable growth. And if you're not switching the mindset from features, options, customer adoption, and market share, and weaving into that process profitable customer engagement, Wall Street will punish you, and we all know it's, they're good at it. They're really, really good at it. This is one of my favorite phrases. If you tell me how somebody gets paid, I'm gonna tell you how they behave. And one of the interesting things I learned on the private equity side is a lot of C-suite folks are compensated based on improving EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Most people don't think that, oh wait, that's the whole cap, CapEx, OpEx thing. It goes beyond the accounting department because now you're getting in the way of somebody's paycheck who has the ability to impact your paycheck. That gets interesting sometimes. I had the good fortune at AWS to be on the outside looking in, but you also have to have those sensitive conversations, and I would phrase things in terms of free cash flow. Because with a private equity company, they've got a holding period, three, five, seven years, they're going to have what they call a liquidity event. They're going to 
combine you with another company, they're going to take you public, they're going to break you up in pieces and sell the parts for the greater sum than the whole, whatever the case may be. But for every dollar of expense reduction, there's a multiplier of cash on the back end. That makes the operating partner at the private equity firm happy. That makes the C-suite folks happy. So I've been in conversations where it's like, well, you know, it's not in the budget. Would, let's go it over to the CapEx budget. And we're very much not in the accounting advice business. I sure as heck am not. I'm not a CPA. But you need to think about your audience and what incents them personally. And, and to me, that's also very, very important. And with the PE and the whole VC and the public markets, there's people outside your organization you have to, be, you have to keep happy. So when you can talk in terms of improving margin, when you can talk in terms of improving profitability, reducing customer churn by implementing a feature, because you, these are things you can measure. It really helps the conversation quite a bit. The last two is um, I'm putting up there because I'm a little bit jaded, not bitter, but jaded, is I've been in situations where third many folks buy through a third party. And at Amazon, the policy was, if you buy through a third party reseller, we needed the permission of the reseller to engage the customer who was still owned by PE. So now it's a four party conversation. You've got the cloud provider, you've got the owner, you've got the portfolio company, and you've got the person the portfolio company is buying their services from. And oftentimes, and I'm going to be very Amazon specific, so uh, for GCP and Azure folks, I apologize. The third party provider owns the payer account and the individual companies are linked accounts to the payer. Sometimes it's one to one, sometimes they have a payer and they have many, many companies unrelated to one another below. And before we would present to the individual portfolio companies, we'd present to the third party reseller. And I've had more than one situation where we were able to take, have cost takeout actionable items that would reduce them before the, below their commitment spends on reserved instances and savings plans. And the third party provider's like, well, if they spend less, we're on the hook to pay for that. We're not going to let you talk to them. You've got to be, you've got to think about the interested parties in the conversation and what their gain or lack of gain is from that. Which brings me to the last one. Uh, you know, it's, I think in economics, I call it perverse incentives. How are salespeople compensated? We all know the answer. You don't have to, you don't have to guess. And I've been in situations where we show and present to the salesperson before presenting to the customer, and they're all about, well, you can't tell them that. That's, you know, I've got a vacation planned. The cool part about Amazon culture, I will say, is it's very much an escalated, escalation-oriented culture, and that whole customer obsession thing, it, it's, it's the real deal. And when you have to escalate and talk to managers and whatnot to get the right thing done on behalf of the customer. So the, the, the key takeaway is think about what the incentives are for all the parties as you present your FinOps plan, as you execute your FinOps plan. This is what I ran into at Allstate. You know, if you report up through the accounting side, the engineers are like, huh, well, who's that person? And why are they coming in? And how in the heck can accounting help me be a better engineer? If you're on the engineering side, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a back and forth. They, there's, there's a lot of uh, interplay and mistrust. And what I ran into is the director, I reported up through engineering. The director of finance thought engineering was setting up a shadow accounting operation. And it took me three to four weeks to spend with him a couple times a day to walk through, here's how the cloud works, here's how the bills work, here's how it differs from that. Allstate runs two fantastic data centers. And they put this division in the cloud because it was suited for its purposes, which I can't talk about. Uh, openly, but it was the right move and it was the right thing to do. But he thought my goal was to set up an accounting department that he didn't have control of, which is completely not the goal. My goal is for FinOps to support him with his closing process, margin analysis, the FP&A members on his team, and help deliver meaningful and accurate information to the organization. 
And since I had the engineering background, I'm well suited more than somebody who's just got a finance and accounting background to help do that. And I asked him, give me one or two people to train and be a part of these meetings. I want them in every meeting I'm at. They're invited to everything. There's total transparency here. On the other side, you know, you're, you're thinking about creating awareness and accountability for the cloud spend. And, and the trouble you run into is, uh, who, who are my engineers in the room? I walk in and say, I'm the FinOps guy. Here's how you should be handling your architecture. How fast will you shun me? It, you have to have a delicate conversation around that. I was an engineer, a bit of a prima donna. I think a lot of engineers are because it's a creative thing, creative folks in general. And that's awesome. That makes you excellent at your job. And you need to have those conversations and show the engineer on-prem to be a good engineer. Get the job done, meet my SLAs, meet all my internal policies and requirements, make sure I don't do anything that's gonna get me in trouble regulatory. To be a great cloud engineer, all of that, and defend or expand margin. And you wanna show an engineer that you're essential to the success of this business. And again, Bruce and I were kind of chatting, and this is a conversation I had with uh, Eric Peterson yesterday. He said, it's one thing to come in and say, I've worked all weekend and I got this thing to work. It was really difficult. I stayed up all night, lots of Red Bull, didn't go out with my friends, had a good time, you know, didn't have a good time, worked, and I delivered. It's another thing to come in and say, I worked all weekend and I improved the gross product or the gross margin on our largest line of business by 13 basis points. I tell you what, the CFO and the accounting folks will understand the second conversation a whole lot then. Ah, you worked your butt off over the weekend. What do I care? So think about the words you choose, what you're going to say, how you say it, and, and be very, very thoughtful is probably the bottom line in all that. Because really, I think the, the goal of FinOps is to facilitate good decision making. What am I going to do next based upon what am I measuring today? This is what I run into very much in lift and shift. It's very much, you know, on-prem, all gas, no brakes. I can run it and it's all good. And if I get it done before it's due, life is good. Operating all gas, no brakes is not a methodology for the cloud. It's a great way to go bankrupt very, very, very quickly. Um, and I liken this to the term fitness. So any CrossFit people here? They call it the sport of fitness. And my answer to that is fit for what? You have to be fit for something. And the example I give from the sporting world is there's a world famous middle distance runner by the name of El Garouche, gold medalist in the 1500, 2000 meters, 5000 meters, used to hold the world record for the indoor and the mile up until 2019. Best in class. Usain Bolt, fastest man I think who's ever been recorded in a race, runs the 100, 200, 400, and I think he might have a leg of the four by 100. Usain Bolt, six foot five, weighs over 200 pounds. El Garouche is five foot nine, weighs 128. They are both supremely fit. Workloads need standards. You also then have the, the Goldilocks problem. For those of you who are not familiar with Goldilocks, she's this little miscreant who breaks into bears' houses and she eats their food and sleeps in their bed and she declares, this, one, this porridge is too hot, this porridge is too cold, and this one's just right. And she messed up all three bowls but eats one of them completely. You need to have the same kind of mentality with your workloads. Too much, not enough. You can't tell me too much or not enough unless you have standards. Then you have to instrument to detect too much. You have to instrument to detect not enough. And then you have to course correct in your architecture and your design and your development. Because not enough creates customer irritation. Not enough means you miss your SLAs. Too much means you're crushing margin. And for the folks coming from the on-prem world, it isn't something they really had to think about unless you had customer facing web, you know, web pages and a web portal or what have you, or you or in the app writing business. But a lot of stuff is back end. And back end folks never had to worry about that. And that's something you should really get them to start thinking about is what, what I like to refer to as the Goldilocks problem. The other thing is don't risk shift. I've been in so many meetings where I say, oh yeah, you know, giving the sales pitch. Amazon EC2 spot, you can save up to 70%, to which the CEO of the company is like, we're running everything on spot. 
and let the giggles in the room understand exactly what the problem is. Not every workload is suitable for SPOD. If you do make those trade-offs, and sometimes you're asked to make those cost trade-offs, it's like anything else. You can be the most secure company in the world, but you're going to pay for that security. You can have active, active, real-time everything, and in the event of a fail, fail, the failover is immediate and transparent. But that comes with a cost. FinOps, making bad architectural choices to save money, is simply moving financial risk into operational risk. You may be asked to do it. All I would give you as my advice and counsel is get consensus and for goodness sakes, get it in writing because it will come back to bite you in the rear end because more times than not, it is the wrong answer. So don't let people bully you into, we need to save money, we need to save money. And a good buddy of mine who's a trainer loves the phrase at the top, the goal of the goal is to keep the goal of the goal. And if, you and if you syntactically break that down, it basically says, don't move your goalposts, stay true to your path. Don't get distracted. Stay the course, work the program, and, and good things will happen. Because it's my belief when you really break it down, FinOps is about facilitating well-informed decisions through education, trust building, collaboration, celebrating the wins, having those blameless post-mortems because I do believe it is about providing high quality and better information at an improved rate of velocity. And it's all the things that were discussed today with data and education and when we had that word cloud. I mean, I think that was just a fantastic idea. And for FinOps, to me, that's what's important. I wanna get people making better decisions faster. I want more correct decisions, more informed decisions. Do we know what we're gonna be doing two, three, four quarters from now? No, but I can tell you what we're going to be doing next week because the data is showing me the path in the short term. If you've got long-term predictive models, I absolutely want to talk to you afterwards because I want to learn from you. But other than that, I want to thank you very much for your time. And if you have questions, uh, please do ask. Yes. Hey, you went fast. We talked about this right beforehand. I'm like, okay, how long is this going to take? Is this going to take the whole 30 minutes? Is this going to be a little short? And he's like, no, I'm pretty sure it's going to be almost all 30 minutes unless I get sidetracked, which you did really good. You didn't get sidetracked, apparently. You kept right on course there. So we do have about seven minutes for questions after this is lunch. So I expect the best questions, and then I'll tell you where to get lunch. So that's a good plan. Um, Coming back here, also I really like the part where you said um, don't display your knowledge of FinOps at the expense of other people. I think that's such a great thing to keep in mind. So, yeah. Hey, that's a good presentation, thank you. So uh, what kind of strategy or tactics can you take to start educating engineers on business speak? Because that's hard, right? Yeah, their goals aren't really about business, it's about technical delivery. And they talk that way and you know, what, what's your, can you share a bit more detail on, on that experience? I, I like to speak in terms of, you have an opportunity to create value, and I actually would sit and educate engineers, not in the, the refined elements of debits and credits, but about profit and gross margins and what margins mean. And I always ask the question, would you rather undertake a project that adds a million dollars of revenue to the product you're working on, or would you rather take a project that cuts out $600,000 of expense from that same product? And they sit and they ponder and they give me an answer, but it's a trick question. You don't know the answer unless you know what your gross margins are. Because depending on what your margins are, if you're a, a SaaS and you're at 90% uh, gross profit margin, you're gonna go one way, and if you're at a 30% gross margin, you're gonna go the other way. So I, I it basically, Accounting 101, and I won't call it accounting for dummies because I don't want to, you know, disparage somebody who hasn't had that domain, specific domain of training. But teach them about revenue, cost of goods sold, and gross margin, and how they impact the cost of goods sold, and what their contribution to the cost of goods sold is, and what does it mean. And especially if you're in an organization where you have uh, restricted stock units and, and some kind of ownership. Uh, proposition for folks in the company. When you increase margins, you increase the value of your RSUs. Because again, you tell me how somebody gets paid and I'm gonna tell you how they behave. I'm gonna show them maybe a path they didn't see before about 
your engineering, your architecture decisions, your development decisions, and how you choose to operate will eventually roll into a better opportunities for you professionally, because again, a great cloud engineer needs to understand the cost elements of what they do, how it's good for the company, and how it will benefit you financially. And even if you're not in an RSU basis, then I talk about how it makes your uh, career that much better and makes you a much more valuable to the asset, to the organization, makes you more promotable. And in this uh, you know, great job move over the last couple of years, it makes you more hireable elsewhere. And, and just as, as plain as that, and it probably takes just as long as I spent uh, answering your question to have that conversation, because it's terms everyone understands, even if you don't understand debits and credits. All right, any other questions, folks? Oh, one from the front row. I kind of like walking around with this mic. I feel like I'm on a game show, but nobody's really winning anybody, but you're learning how possibly to save some money. So here you go. Thanks. Hey, the slide that uh, stood out to me was the one about trust. If you sit in the accounting department, then engineering doesn't trust you. If you sit in the engineering department, then accounting doesn't trust you. I report up to the COO. Um, I'm the head of data at our company, mm -hmm. and so, the thought with sort of starting to move some of this FinOps process over into us is obviously we've operationalized a lot of the reporting. Uh, we're kind of a neutral third party. I think we're starting to make some headway with both finance and engineering uh, where there isn't a, you know, a, really a trust-based relationship between mm -hmm. the two of them. Um, I guess my question is, well, so I'm, I'm hopeful that as time goes on, trust is going to grow and all the good FinOps things are going to happen. I guess my question is, um, am I an idiot <laughs> for thinking that? For, for being, well, I, I believe in, in, like in the educational component of, of FinOps, I'm going to show you how we can, you can be a better engineer, kind of the things I discussed just briefly. On the accounting side, you know, accounting is a cost center. If you can show accounting leadership how you can reduce the cost and improve the quality of information, because you can get both of those wins, that you're going to help them with their FP&A process. I'm a big fan of unit metrics. I think that's the key to, to life in, in the cloud, because it uh, separates increases in bill due to, to growth in the customer base and, and consumption versus increase in the bill due to efficiency issues. Um, how, how show you how you're going to make every you're going to make the engineers more successful at what they do. You're going to make accounting operations easier and more accurate, and you're going to help propel the closing process forward, provide better inputs to the FP&A process, and you know it's kind of like being a, a servant leader. I'm here to help you do your role better, and here's the tools I can offer you if you give me support, and that's how I like to approach the accounting side of the house. Because for them, and again, at Allstate, Allstate kept meticulously perfect books. You may say what you like about insurance companies, but that accounting and audit organization is as ethical as can be. And it was all about operational efficiency because I was in Allstate Investments. And on the investment side of a house, of a, of a trading house, if you get above so many basis points of assets under management, Goldman Sachs will do it for a fixed price, State Street, Bank of New York. So it was about... It, when I sold it, that for them is like you know job preservation, efficiency, making you better at what you do. Accountants, I had a very off-color term for it, but would you rather be messing around with data, or would you rather be analyzing data and getting information from that data? I can help you move to the to the analyze and value side of it, where you're getting the benefit of a high-priced CPA doing CPA things versus a CPA who doesn't trust the data and is always doing their own individual checks and whatnot. And that makes their life easier because closing is closing. And if you're a public company, closing's on a deadline per the SEC. And if you can get them time back, you are a hero. And then and, and sell the benefits. All right, I'm gonna cut it off at that. It is the end. I just wanna give Mike a huge round of applause. Thank you, Mike. JR here from the FinOps Foundation. Thank you for watching. Please go to FinOps.org if you want to get plugged into this amazing community. And of course, hit subscribe right here on YouTube to get all the future content. Hope to see you soon.